أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم طاسين ميم تلك آيات الكتاب المبين لعلك باقع نفسك ألا يكونوا مؤمنين إن شأن ننزل عليهم من السماء آية فظلت أعناقهم لها خاضعين وما يأتيهم من ذكر من الرحمن محدث وما يأتيهم من ذكر من الرحمن محدث إلا كانوا عنه معرضين فقد كذبوا فسيأتيهم أم ما كانوا به يستهزئون أولم يروا إلى الأرض كم أنبتنا فيها من كل زوج كريم إن في ذلك لآية وما كان أكثرهم مؤمنين وإن ربك لهو العزيز الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والعاقبة للمتقين والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين الحمد لله we started سورة الشعراء سورة نمبر 26 in the previous session where we covered the introduction and the first uh, three ayat of the surah very quickly I'll go over the translation and then we'll start from ayah number 4 with the in-depth discussion inshallah so yesterday what we talked about, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts the surah in that very miraculous, powerful uh, manner, Taseem Mim, the disjointed letters. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that these are the signs of the book that clarifies everything. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam directly and says that it seems as if you will destroy yourself that you will kill yourself out of concern and worry that why these people don't become believers? Why they don't believe? Why don't they come around? Why don't they realize what they're doing? And now we're starting from ayah number four. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in ayah number four, He says, إِنَّ شَأْ نُنَزِّلَ عَلَيْهِمْ مِنَ السَّمَاءِ آيَةً فَظَلَّتْ أَعْنَاقُهُمْ لَهَا خَاضِعِينَ We went over the translation of the first nine ayat yesterday, but just very briefly uh, to remind myself and everybody, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, if we had wished, we could have sent them down a sign from heaven at which their necks would stay bowed in utter humility. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts off the ayah by saying, in. In in the Arabic language means if. But something very interesting uh, about the rhetorical usage of some of these words is that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses in to suggest something, the possibility of something, it usually is subtly saying that this will not occur, or this will not happen, or this should not happen. So even though Allah is saying if, but what he's actually saying is that if we wanted to, the following could have occurred, could happen. But the fact of the matter is, Allah is saying, we will not do the following. But if we wanted to, we could. In nasha, Allah says that if we wanted to, in nasha, nunazzil alayhim min as ayatan. We would have sent down, nunazzil comes from the word tanzil, which literally means to send something down. And that's the exact verb that's used when talking about the revelation of the Qur'an. So if we wanted to, we would have sent down upon them. Now there's something very interesting here. Sometimes the preposition for the word sending down can be ala. Okay, ala means upon. There's another preposition that is used with this verb, and that is the preposition ila. Ila means to. The target of something, towards something, to someone. And then there's upon. Even though using the word upon is not, doesn't completely have a negative connotation. But nevertheless, typically when Allah speaks to like the Prophet wasallam, He talks about sending something to him. Sending revelation to him. Sending guidance to him. Sending revelation to us. 
That's the, that's the word Allah uses. When he talks about sending it upon them, there, here in this context, there's a negative connotation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not talking about sending some revelation. Allah is not t- talking about sending them some, you know, beautiful, miraculous sign of guidance and truth. No, no, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying sending something down upon them. Like something falling on them from the sky. In nasha' nunazil alayhim. Mina sama'i from the sky, ayatan. The word ayah, of course, again means a sign. That if we wanted to, Allah says, we could have sent down upon them, we could have made fall on them from the sky such a huge miraculous sign that everything would have become apparent and obvious. No doubt would remain as to what exactly is going on here. And what would be the consequence of that? Fadallat. There, this word that you see here, fadallat, is actually two words. The first is the letter fa, which is known as the fa of consequence. <coughs> Consequently speaking, therefore, or as a, as a result, okay? The fa of consequence. So Allah is saying, and then what would have been the outcome of that? Subsequently, dhallat, that it would have bowed down. What would have bowed down? A'naquhum. Their necks would have bowed down. Their necks would have been lowered. Now what does that exactly mean? If you translate it as I just did, literally, it talks about their necks being lowered. We, even we, some, in English as well, we have enough expressions to kind of understand and grasp what that symbolizes, what that represents, right? When you talk about somebody's head being lowered, right, somebody's sulking, we have that same idea, that same expression, because it's really based off of, you know, uh, reading people's body language. So that's why we grasp that, but nevertheless, just in case somebody feels like the literal translation sounds kind of obtuse or awkward, right? Next being lowered, what that basically means is that they would have been humbled. They would have been humbled. It would humble them. It would subjugate them into humility. It would put them in their place. And that is represented by the neck being lowered. فَظَلَّتَ عَنَقُهُمْ Their necks would be lowered. لَهَا خَادِعِينَ And they would have been completely humbled. Again, خُدُوعَ خَدَعَ In the Arabic language means for something to like crumble. For something to collapse in and fall in on itself. They would have just completely fallen down on their knees in front of it. Because of it. It would have put them in their place. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there's, there's a little linguistic kind of uh, nuance here that's interesting. It's a bit advanced, so if you don't completely grasp it or understand it, don't worry. It's something that will make sense as we go along further in our study. But I'll try my best to explain it. The word khadi'in is what we call, what we typically refer to as a human plural. Khadi'in is a human plural. Okay? Now, it's referring back to a'naquhum. Okay, now typically the way that Arabic grammar works, it's a, think of it as an adjective for their necks. Their necks will be humbled, will fall down. Okay, the word a'naq is what we refer to in Arabic as a broken plural. The adjective for a broken plural is usually singular feminine. But this is plural masculine. So there seems to be a little bit of inconsistency between the noun, a'naq, necks, and then the adjective, humbled. It's like, it says the word necks, and then it uses like a plural, human plural masculine adjective. So there doesn't seem to be synchronicity. And it's explained by explaining the fact that when it talks about the necks, it's not so much talking about their necks, it's talking about them. The neck is a part of the human being. So this is a part of eloquence in the Arabic language that even though, like for instance, if you're talking about somebody's eyes, okay, you're talking about somebody's eyes, and you want to basically say that his, there was shame in his eyes. Okay, there was shame in his eyes. His eyes looked shameful. If that's the expression that in Arabic, when you talk about, when you bring the adjective for being shameful, you would bring it in the plural form, the human plural form, not, in that, that way it would become an adjective for the person, not just an adjective for the eyes. Here, even though it said their necks will be lowered, but the consequence of their necks being lowered is that they will be humbled. So the adjective addresses the whole person, not just the neck. 
So this is a very interesting kind of dynamic. The Mufassirun have discussed it at length. Um, this is, I guess, a little bit of y'all's introduction to the fact that most Mufassirun are what we endearingly would refer to as super nerdy, and so they like to discuss these types of things. All right? And I enjoy reading those discussions. وَمَا يَأْتِيهِمْ مِنْ ذِكْرٍ مِنَ الرَّحْمَانِ مُحْدَثٍ إِلَّا كَانُوا عَنْهُ مُعْرِضٍ Ayah number five. A translation, a brief translation of ayah number five is, whenever they are brought a new revelation from the Lord of mercy, they turn away. So in ayah number four, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, look, this is really simple. If we wanted to, we would have just made the sky fall down upon them. We would have ripped the sky open like it will occur on the day of judgment. إِذَا الشَّمْسُ كُبِّرَتْ وَإِذَا النُّجُومُ كَدَرَتْ وَإِذَا الْجِبَالُ سُيِّرَتْ وَإِذَا الْعِشَارُ عُطِّلَتْ Right, like Allah talks about this in the Qur'an. That when the sun will boil over and the star, stars will come crashing down from the sky and the, earth, the oceans will boil over, the earth will be ripped apart, the sky will come crashing down and the day of judgment will occur. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in ayah number four is saying, look, if you wanted to, we'd just bring the sky crashing down on them right now. We'd rip this whole universe apart and then everybody would know exactly what's going on. But Allah is saying, we don't do that. I, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, He does not do that. Why? There's a hint, there's a clue in ayah number five as to why Allah does not do that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا يَأْتِيهِمْ مِن ذِكْرٍ Whenever any type of a reminder comes to them, any type of a reminder comes to them. And who is this reminder coming from? مِنَ Rahman. It's coming from Ar-Rahman, the most merciful. That right there is a clue. The reason why Allah just does not destroy this whole universe and just doesn't bring, you know, doesn't bring all of His wrath and His fury down upon humanity that disbelieves and disobeys is because Allah is Ar-Rahman. He is most merciful. And the nature of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy is that He gives time, opportunity after opportunity, time after time, chance after chance, keeps on giving us more and more and more leeway that maybe, eventually, hopefully, somebody will turn things around, will come around. This is the mercy of Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Qur'an, He says, إِنَّ رَحْمَتِي وَسِعَتْ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ Right, in Arabic, y'all are going to learn this. In Arabic, كُلَّ شَيْءٍ means everything. Each and every single thing. No exceptions. Everything. Like Allah says, Allahu khaliqu kulli shay. Allah is the creator of everything. So Allah says in the Quran, in rahmati wasi'at kulla shay. My mercy encompasses everything. Everything. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, He tells us that kataba rabbukum ala nafsihi rahmah. That your Lord, Allah has mandated upon Himself mercy. Allah has decreed and Allah has announced. He has declared that mercy is His policy. And the Prophet ﷺ in a hadith Qudsi, which Allah says, the Prophet ﷺ tells us that God Himself has said, In rahmati sabaqat ghadabi. Wa fi riwayatin, in rahmati ghalabat ghadabi. Allah says that my mercy supersedes, overcomes my wrath and my anger. Allah has declared this. So this is the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Time after time, opportunity after opportunity. And it's really astounding. And to just kind of take a little bit of a case study, an observation as to how this exactly works, what this exactly looks like. You know, look back at the life of the Prophet Some of the people that opposed him most like viciously, without any regard for him, for his family, for people's lives, for people's dignity, even they were given chance after chance after chance. Abu Sufyan. Abu Sufyan is a person whose wife, she, even she herself, take both of them, for example. Abu Sufyan and his wife, Hind. Both of them, 
He led the army on the day of Uhud, in the battle of Uhud. And she hired an assassin to kill the uncle of the Prophet ﷺ and then to mutilate the uncle's body. Ripped off the clothes after he had been killed. His dead body's lying there. Violate the, the corpse. Rip off the clothes. Cut off the ears and nose and cut out the tongue. Put it into a string. Then take a dagger and rip his whole body open. Pull open the body cavity. Take the internal organs and pull them out. And leave him there like this. When the Prophet ﷺ happened upon, this is the uncle of the Prophet ﷺ, Hamza, who he loved so much. He was like an older brother. He was actually his foster brother. They were nursed by the same woman. In spite of being uncle and nephew, they were also brothers, foster brothers. And he was only a little bit older than the Prophet ﷺ, so he was like an older brother to the Prophet ﷺ. He was the one always with his arm around the Prophet ﷺ's shoulder. And when the Prophet ﷺ happened upon Hamza's body and he saw him in this condition, the Sahaba say, we heard like this groaning sound. It sounded like two stones grinding against each other, coming out from inside of him, from his chest. It, it was so painful for him to see his uncle like this, that it physically was causing him pain. He recoiled by looking at him. And he had to kind of gather himself. And at intervals, for the, throughout that day and the next day and the following day, at different intervals, he would just break down and just tears would start streaming down his face. And so this was so painful for the Prophet ﷺ. And Abu Sufyan, his wife was the one who was responsible for this. And he himself, before he left the battlefield of Uhud, he made an announcement. He stood up on the mount, one of the hills, one of the mountains of Uhud, and he yelled and he made an announcement. And the Prophet ﷺ heard the announcement that he made. He says that, تَجِدُونَ فِي قَتْلَاكُمْ مُثْلَى تَجِدُونَ فِي قَتْلَاكُمْ مُثْلَى لَمْ أَمُرْ بِهِ وَلَمْ أَنْهَاهُ You will find that some of your dead have been mutilated. The corpses of some of your deceased have been violated. Inhumane. He says, I did not tell them to do it, but I didn't stop them from doing it either when I saw them. He was complicit. Yet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives him and his wife time after time, opportunity after opportunity. They led multiple campaigns after that against the Prophet ﷺ and the Muslims. And it finally comes to a point where they are sitting in front of the Prophet ﷺ. At the moment of Fath Makkah, the conquest of Makkah, they are humbled in front of the Prophet ﷺ, begging for mercy and saying, please forgive us. Please forgive us. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows them to believe, and the Prophet ﷺ says, لا تثريب عليكم اليوم. I have no score to settle with you. You're forgiven. This is the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the system that Allah has put in place. And we are all beneficiaries of this. وَمَا يَأْتِيهِم مِّن ذِكْرٍ مِّنَ الرَّحْمَانِ Every single time Allah says, a reminder comes to them from the Most Merciful Himself. مُحْدَثٍ Beautiful. This one word, مُحْدَثٍ, is so beautiful, so powerful. <clears throat> the word مُحْدَثٍ comes from the word إِحْدَاث. إِحْدَاث in the Arabic language means to... I'm going to use this word. I know that this word from Muslims has a little bit of baggage, but stay with me. It means quite literally to innovate. To innovate. Now everyone immediately, all their bid'ah alarms are going off. Innovation. Right? I personally am of the opinion, I think innovation is a terrible translation for bid'ah. Bid'ah is a bad thing. Alright? It's the, it's, in a certain context, it's the, it's the antonym, the opposite of sunnah. Sunnah is something rooted within the tradition, within the religion. Bid'ah is something that is from outside the religion, outside the tradition. I don't personally like the translation of innovation. It's one of those Muslim English words. Alright? Distortion, perversion. These are better translations for bid'ah in my very humble estimation. But if you just take the word innovation to innovate, literally in the English language, to be creative, to be creative, 
in your approach to something. That's what the word ihdath means to. It, it, that's what it means. It means to be very creative in your approach to something. Muhdathin, muhdathin, it, it means to be very, very creative in your approach. So Allah is saying, not only does Allah keep on sending them reminders, most mercifully, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala most mercifully keeps on sending them reminders in different, different forms, in different, different ways, through different people, at different times, in different places. It's like, just think about it, like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, all the, all, the, all the processes that are being put into place, all the effort that is being made to save someone, to get through to someone, it's remarkable. And what does Allah owe us? Nothing. This is, this is kind of hard to swallow a lot of times. But this is, a, this is one of those bitter pills that is really good for us. Allah is the Rabb and I am the Abd. Allah is the master and I'm the slave. Allah is the Malik, He's the owner, I'm the Mamluk, I'm the property. Allah is the merciful, I'm the one in need of the mercy. Allah is the one who feeds, I'm the one who needs to be fed. Allah is the one in charge and I'm the one at His mercy. That's our relationship. It is the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the generosity and the kindness of Allah, that He rewards us and gives us what, I, what He's promised us. And that He promises anything at all. Otherwise, we, don't, we can't demand anything from Allah. He doesn't owe us anything. But to think that Allah is so merciful, that He keeps on sending reminder after reminder, mercifully, Different, different ways and shapes and forms and times and places. To try to get through. To try to save the person. Help them understand what's good for them. That's the blessing, that's the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But the tragedy of it all, the more Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keeps sending all these different forms and types of you know, very creative reminders and wake-up calls. They keep on ignoring it, neglecting it, and turning away from it. Al-i'rad, mu'aridin, al-i'rad means to turn. And the preposition anhu, an, means away from something. Anhu mu'aridin. They continuously turn away from it. They just ignore it. They keep on turning away. The more the reminder comes, the more they turn away. The more different the reminder, the more creative they become, tragically, in their approach, in their, in their ignoring and neglecting of that reminder. إِلَّا كَانُوا عَنْهُمْ وَعَلِبِينَ In ayah number 6, from here, from the end of ayah number 5 into ayah number 6, there's a very interesting progression that the Mufassirun have talked about. Y'all might remember earlier today in class, we talked about kind of the process of building faith, the progression of faith building. And we talked about how, in shakartum wa amantu. First of all, remembering your blessings, humbling yourself, developing an attitude of gratitude, that helps one foster faith. That process, step by step. Become aware of your blessings, humble yourself, actually show some thanks and appreciation, and then watch faith take root and grow from there. Alright? It's the fertile soil of the heart. Al-Iman ma waqara fil qalbi wa saddaqahu amal. When you plant that seed of gratitude within the soil of the fertile soil of the heart, watch faith grow from there. وَمَثَلُ كَلِمَةٍ طَيِّبَةٍ كَشَجَرَةٍ طَيِّبَةٍ أَصْلُهَا ثَابِتْ وَفَرْعُهَا فِي السَّمَاءِ It's a beautiful tree. The roots are very strong and sound and firm. But the branches are far off into the sky. تُؤْتِي أُكُلَهَا كُلَّ حِينٍ بِإِذْنِ رَبِّيَا And it keeps on delivering its fruits, its benefit. It becomes a true blessing in your life. On so many different levels. And so here, at the end of ayah number 5 and into ayah number 6, we have the opposite, something really scary. How does somebody get to the point of just absolute 
disbelief. Like that insolence. Where it's just a total disregard and disrespect. Total disbelief. Like how does a person get there? Right? It's shocking. If you have an iota of faith, you sometimes look at that type of, you know, insolent, stubborn disbelief, and it, it's a bit shocking. Like how can a human being be like that? How can anyone be like that? But from the end of ayah number five, through ayah number six, it lays out how that occurs. So first of all, Allah is constantly sending us reminders. There are reminders. The next ayah, ayah number seven, is going to talk about all the reminders that are around us. But there are constant reminders, most mercifully being provided within our lives. But the first step is, people start ignoring those reminders. They start turning away from them. They start becoming unattentive, apathetic, towards those blessings and reminders within their lives. Because the blessings are the reminders. Ayah number 6, Allah says, فَقَدْ كَذَّبُوا فَسَيَأْتِيهِمْ أَنْبَاءُ مَا كَانُوا بِهِ يَسْتَحْزِئُونَ A brief translation of ayah number 6, They deny it, but the truth of what they scorned will soon hit them. The first step is, you just stop paying attention to your blessings and your reminders. Neglectful, like I said before. Unattentive. Apathetic. Self-indulgent behavior. You're just too busy being indulged all the time within yourself and your own activities and your own frivolity. But then what's the, what's the second step? Eventually what happens? The, hard, the heart, excuse me, the heart starts to harden. It starts to calcify. فَقَدْ كَذَّبُوا And then you start to reject. You start to deny. So the next time a blessing is put in your face, the next time a blessing is shown to you, look, you just completely disavow it. No, I don't think so. Like don't you think this is a blessing in your life? Allah's put a roof over your head? Yeah, a leaky roof. You see that now? Allah's blessed you with a family. Yeah, an annoying family. <laughs> right? You have a car. Yeah, a rickety one. Makes noise. Like that's, you start to push back. What blessing? What are you talking about? I don't see no blessing. I don't have this. I don't have that. That starts to become the reality. The person is tainted now. The heart is polluted. That lens is no longer clear. And so what happens? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَسَيَعْتِيهِمْ Very soon, it will come to them. What will come to them? أَنْبَاءُ The realities. مَا كَانُوا بِهِ يَسْتَحْزِئُونَ Of those things that they used to mock. And therein lies the third, the furthest point that a person get, can get from faith. The furthest point that a person can get from faith, from belief. And that is, then the person just straight up just mocks the religion. Oh, why don't you go live your fairy tale? Go do your prayer or magical incantation so that magically everything's going to be better in your life? Right? That becomes that person's reality. Now they just start mocking. Ridiculing. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that once a person gets to that particular point, where they are mocking and ridiculing the deen, the religion itself, Allah and His Messenger and His book, and all the blessings Allah has provided to them in their lives, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala delivers a warning that not even right now, not right away, but very soon, they will face the realities of what they've done, of what they've mocked. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us all. In ayah number 7, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أَوَلَمْ يَرَوْا إِلَى الْأَرْضِ كَمْ أَنْبَتْنَا فِيهَا مِنْ كُلِّ زَوْجٍ كَرِيمٍ Again, a very brief translation. 
Do they not see the earth? And what kinds of noble things we grow in it? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here, for the believer reading this, who reads this and is appalled by it, is frightened by it. I don't want to end up like that. I don't want to start. I don't, and this is why Abdullah bin Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhuma, he used to say that even verses, even ayats that are very obviously and directly about the disbelievers. He says there is a very stern warning and, a, and an extremely cautionary tale therein for believers. Because what it does is that even though it's talking about the outcome, but oftentimes it will highlight the process of how they got there. It will give you the symptoms, the early symptoms. So you might not be, term, you might not be terminal yet in terms of lacking faith, but maybe you started to show. Maybe you've started to manifest some of the early symptoms of that disbelief. And so read it very carefully. With an open mind and an open heart. Humble yourself. Make sure nothing, you never tread down that path. Make sure you never allow that to happen to you. So when we read that, we see, okay, they're mocking Allah. That's way far off the deep end. And then they are completely rejecting everything. Okay, that seems quite drastic as well. But it started off by just starting to pay less attention to all the blessings in your life. And not be as grateful to Allah. Not see all the signs of God's mercy and His blessing upon you within your life. So for those of us who are worried by reading that, that I don't even ever want to get near that dynamic, I don't want to ever get to that point, what can I do? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in ayah number 7 says, أَوَلَمْ يَرَوْا إِلَى الْأَرْضِ Have they not looked to the earth? كَمْ أَنْبَتْنَا فِيهَا How many different things we have sprouted out from within the earth? مِنْ كُلِّ زَوْجٍ كَرِيمٍ From all different types of very beneficial vegetation and provision. From all different types of beneficial provisions, we have sprouted out from the earth. Like all the food and all the sustenance and the blessings that Allah provides. That the roof over your, hell, over your head is built from the wood that grew out of the earth. That the tools that you use, the stones and things like that, the tools or the metals that you use came out of the earth. That the water that you drink to survive, you pull it out of the earth. And the food that you're eating comes out of the earth. Or the food that you're eating, eat what comes out of the earth. It's Texas at the end of the day, alright? Let's be clear. Alright? But, you understand the point. It's all coming out of the earth. It's all right there. It's all provided for you. Allah has made everything available to you. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, مِن كُلِّ زَوْجٍ The word zawj, when we see that word, somebody probably thought like, oh, it's talking about husbands and wives. Right? It can refer to that, but zawj actually just means like different types of things. And then when it's used in that particular context, it talks, it's talking about spouses. But zawj can also mean different categories and different types of things. Okay? And then it says the word kareem. It says that these things are kareem. I thought kareem is an attribute of Allah. Allah is al-kareem. He is. The noble, the generous, the gracious. But the Prophet ﷺ has also been described as kareem. Alright, he's also been described as kareem. Because he was also very gracious and noble and generous. And the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here are also referred to as kareem. And this is why from ancient Arabic, they, two things. Number one, they used to refer to food as karam. Any type of good food that would be put before them, they would call it karam. And then also more specifically, the word karam was eventually allocated to speak about grapes. They would call grapes karam. And the reason for that was, for the Arabs, grapes were seen as kind of a delicacy. They were seen as some, some very luxurious, fancy type of fruit that wasn't available very commonly. 
So that's why they refer to it as karam. But even before that, any type of good, clean provision, good, clean food, sustenance, would be referred to as karam. It's a blessing. So that's why Allah says, look at all the blessings that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provides. Now, some of the scholars mention here that not everything that grows out of the earth is always really nice and fancy and great tasting. Sometimes it's spoiled, sometimes it's rotten. So why is Allah saying, min kulli zawjin kareem? All of it is kareem. All of it is a blessing and beneficial. So the Mufassirun, Imam Ar-Razi rahimahullah ta'ala and others, they explain that the reason why, it's such a profound benefit. He says the reason why Allah says, gives it the attribute of Kareem, that everything God has provided to you is Kareem, because even if you're not able to see the blessing in it, there is blessing in it. It is your shortcoming, there is no shortcoming in the provision that Allah provides. We are ungrateful. We forget the blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in anything and everything. In anything and everything. This is going to seem kind of a little off topic, but just it just reminded me. Just as in, sometimes we just don't recognize or realize, see the benefit in something. I remember, my, so my kids, you know, they like to go out in the backyard and run around and play and things like that. So they were playing, running around in the backyard, and they, you know, they were like, oh my God, bugs, right? Big old bug, they got kind of frightened. So I went out, I went out there and I saw this big old nasty, I think, crawling in and out of a hole in the ground. And I, this is a couple of years back, I was just ignorant, I didn't recognize it. So I was like, oh my gosh, that's, that's kind of crazy. Kids play out here. I don't want these big crazy bucks to be out here. And so I called the exterminator and he came over and I said, you know, we got this bug problem over here, look at this in the dirt. And he looks in the hole and he sees one of the bugs and he's like, oh, that's a cicada. And I was like, oh, okay. And uh, <laughs> problem solved, okay, right? And he's like, no, it's harmless. It won't do anything to you. But he said, this is, you do not want to get rid of these. I said, why? He says, you know how in North Texas here we have like fire ants? Huge problem. And he said, that's something that will actually really badly harm your children, fire ants. You end up in the hospital, right? And he said that the cicadas, they eat the fire ants. They'll get rid of the fire ants. So they're good for you. Ajib. I just saw this big nasty critter. I just wanted to like kill it. Right? But blessing. Kareem. Allah put blessing in it. That's actually protecting my children from play, in, while playing in the backyard. Not harming them. Ajib. Right? That's the system that Allah's created. Just a silly little example, at least from me. But it's just so many things like that. In the next ayah, ayah number eight, ayah number eight and ayah number nine. Ayah number eight and ayah number nine are two ayat, ayatain, two verses that are repeated within this surah. I forget exactly, either nine or ten times. They're repeated within this surah. And this is something that is a very powerful style within the Quran. At takraru aslu tawkid. Sahibul ajlumiya. He says, at takraru aslu tawkid. Repetition is the most fundamental form of emphasizing something in the Arabic language. Now, a lot of times we think repetition, what's another word similar to repetition? That has a more negative connotation. Redundancy. But we have to understand the line between repetition and redundancy. You understand? It becomes redundant when it doesn't have, it does not serve a benefit there. Somebody's just repeating themselves over and over again like a broken record. That's why we call it a broken record. Okay? That's redundancy. There's no benefit in it. Why are you saying it over and over again? But repetition is actually something that is a very powerful rhetorical tool. Right? And the very obvious example of that is of course Surah Rahman. 33 times Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala repeated. فَبِ أَيِّ آلَاءِ رَبِّكُمَا تُكَذِّبًا Right? But it's not redundant, it's beautiful, it's powerful. Right? And so when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes a point that we are not to miss, that is not to be missed, 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes it very obviously and very bluntly by repeating it to make that point. And so this is a point that is going to be made repeatedly within the surah, very powerfully. And we'll observe the magnitude of that point that's being made every single time it comes up inshallah. So in ayah number eight, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّ فِي ذَلِكَ لَآيَةً Most definitely, in that. In that. The word ذَلِكَ, a lot of times in the Arabic language, if there's been a conversation, there's been a discussion, a series of points have been made. And at the end of that discussion, after a series of points have been made, then the word ذَلِكَ is brought that it refers to the above mentioned, the aforementioned, the above stated. All right. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, Inna fi dhalika, most definitely, without a shred of a doubt, all of what's been mentioned above here, la ayah. There is a very, very powerful reminder and sign within it. Wama kana aktharuhum. Mu'mini. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, regrettably, many of them will still not believe. Many of them will still not believe. And this is something very interesting, that I was talking to someone recently and they made a very profound point. I was talking uh, with a student who's also um, a counselor um, with a background in like mental health, and something very interesting, the, a point the person made was that, you know, medication, like a physician, a doctor, medication, when they give you antibiotics, you might not want to get better. But that's irrelevant. If you take the pill, you will get better, whether you want to or not. I know that probably doesn't make sense, but just think about it. Maybe somebody's in some weird, bizarre frame of mind. But if they are given the medication, what's going to happen? They're going to get better. By the will of Allah, of course. But you understand what I'm saying. Medication does not require the participation, the compliance of the patient. It does not require it. But what the person was explaining to me about counseling, because oftentimes somebody is sick, somebody is ill, somebody's not well. And they require therapy, counseling. We tell them, right? Or we say about them, they need to get counseling. But the student who's a counselor was actually reminding me that therapy is not like that antibiotic that can just be injected into the arm and it'll just help the person even if they don't want it. That person has to want to get better. The most brilliant psychologist can sit with that person and shrink them all day and night it won't do anything if that person is not willing, is not a willing participant. It's pointless. And faith works the same way. Spirituality works the same way. You can read all the Quran. You can read all the translation. You can listen to all the fantastic lectures. But if you don't actually want to learn, grow, get better, it won't do anything. And that's why Allah says, "Inna fi dhalika la ayah." There's such a powerful sign in what we've just presented to you, Allah is saying. In spite of that, ma kana aktharuhum mu'minin. They still don't believe because they don't want to. And that's why that zeal, that willingness. This is why Allah says Allah guides the one who turns to Allah with an earnest heart. You have to truly want it. That's why we're taught to ask for it. But it's got to stop being just this lip service, just something we repeat and recite. It's got to become something we actually want from our heart. We ask for, we beg for. 
وَإِنَّ رَبَّكَ لَهُ وَالْعَزِيزُ الرَّحْمِ And this is so powerful. In ayah number 9, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Your Lord alone is the Almighty, the Merciful. وَإِنَّ رَبَّكَ Something again very interesting grammatically, it seems like these last two ayahs here, ayah number 8 and ayah number 9, they kind of are one point being made together. And it was very plausible, grammatically speaking, it's very plausible to structure it so that it's kind of like one big sentence. Alright? Where inna fi thalika la ayata wa ma kana akthruhum mu'mineen wa rabbuka lahu wal azizur rahim. Grammatically, they're still separate sentences, but you can kind of merge it together. Okay? But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala completely separates the last part of the statement. Wa inna. Inna tells you that Allah is making this point almost separately. And the reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is making this point separately is because of how important this reminder is. Allah wants us to pay very close attention to this. Wa inna rabbaka. And most definitely, never forget the fact that your Lord and Master Allah, lahuwa, He without a doubt is Al-Aziz. Izzah, a lot of times folks are used to Aziz or Izza, that it means like noble or respectful, which it has an element of that meaning, but in Arabic. In Persian, in Urdu, Farsi, like in these languages, the word Aziz is more, has more to do with kind of nobility and honor and things like that. In Arabic, it's got the element of honor within it, but it's got another heavier component. The other meaning that is included within the meaning of this word in Arabic is dominance, power, confidence. To have the ability to impose your will upon someone else. To be undeniable. You cannot be denied. Lahu al Aziz. That never forget the fact that your Lord and Master Allah, He without a doubt cannot be denied. He will do as He wills. His will shall be done. So if it comes down to the punishment, if you never come around, if you don't listen, that's fine. You've made your decision, you've made your bed, lie in it. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will do as He wills and as He pleases. And there's nobody that can hold Allah accountable. Ar-Rahim, Ar-Rahim comes from Rahma, mercy. It means merciful. But it reminds us at the same time that your Lord is also merciful. That no matter how far you might have gone, if you're still looking for a way back, He will always leave the door open for you. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us of both things. If you decide to take Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as crazy as it sounds, as insane as it sounds, if you decide to take on Allah like head on, challenge God's authority, do your worst, I'm gonna stick to my guns here, then remember that Allah is Aziz. He will not be overcome. He will dominate. But it also doesn't matter how far gone you may be, if you're looking for a way back, always know that He's Rahim and He's always got an open door and He will welcome you back. Every single time. Most mercifully. And this essentially summarizes uh, the first passage of the surah here. Abu Aliya, Qatada, Rabi ibn Anas. Many of them say, Al Aziz fi niqmatihi wa intisarihi mimman khalafa amrahu wa wa abada ghayrahu. That exactly they say, those who decide to defy and oppose Allah, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be Aziz, dominant and powerful with them. Wa qala Sa'id bin Jubayr, Sa'id bin Jubayr, another great student of the companions of the Sahaba, he says, Ar Rahim bi man taba ilayhi wa ana. That he is most merciful with whoever turns to him looking for mercy, and looking for forgiveness. Um, so inshallah, with that, I'll go ahead and conclude here inshallah. If anyone's got any questions, I'll take the questions, but I'll just wrap this up just so that we can inshallah um, start getting ready for the salah, for the prayer. And inshallah, um, 
We'll continue on forward from ayah number 10 in the next session, bi-idhnillahi ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all the ability to practice everything we've said and heard. Uh, subhanallah bihamdihi, subhanakallah bihamdik, nashadu wa la ilaha illa anta, nasaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. Uh, two very quick announcements, inshallah. The first one is that um, there is some extra uh, food, there's some leftover food that's available in a multi-purpose hall. So anybody who would like to take some food back with them, whether it's students, locals, uh, some of our, you know, mashallah, residents here of the community, anybody who would like to take some food with them, inshallah, there's some extra food left over in the multi-purpose hall. So please uh, help yourself, stop by and pick some up so that it doesn't go to waste. Uh, and number two, inshallah, we'll go ahead and get ready for the salah called the Adhan. So please prepare for the salah. Just like the